um, it's been a while. On 4-7-24, I got a prophecy that's for everyone, and it's called, You Are Secure in Me. Hear my voice. My special ones are secure in me. Nothing you shall soon see will harm you. Dramatic things will occur. Have no fear, just lean into me and pray. Close your eyes to the horrors that arise. Keep your mind in worship. Worship, pray, and read my word. Those that do this will be safe from any harms. My hand of protection will not fail any child of mine. Do not shed tears as justice falls. The kindness of the Lord will allow some to suffer great consequences so that they can drop their pride and find me. Pray their hearts are softened. Two have great consequences that brings one to me and avoid suffering in hell for eternity is grace. Do not mourn. Be kind and loving to all in your path. When things become violent, stay home and do not join any social or civic uprisings or rebellions. My people are of peace. Prayer is your best weapon. Do not crave for this world. Be concerned with the most important tasks. Share Jesus with the hopeless. Do not speak against any. Be of peace. Recall Jericho. My people stay in peace and trust me to make the walls fall. Have full faith that I have your back. As things are said that are untrue, stay silent. As strange sights are seen, stay silent. When violence arises, stay silent. I will deliver my people. Time is short stay faithful. Things are about to spiral out of control, but mine will be in perfect peace. Listen to me. Stay quiet. Focus on me. I was also told to read certain verses to you and then to kind of explain them in a simple way, okay, and how it connects to this. So first we're going to look at Jericho. The words we're talking about how we're going to remember Jericho. Everyone knows the story of Jericho. I'm not going there. Joshua 6.10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. And then Hebrews 11.30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. What is the connection to Jericho? We are told to be silent um, until told, and then the battle is won by obedience and faith in God. That is showing us that God hasn't changed from the beginning to the end of when Israel was created as a nation and got their land. God has the same exact rules. Follow what I'm saying. Do what I'm saying to do. Stay silent until I tell you to talk, basically, right? Okay, God was the one who made the walls fall, not the people. And they had, all they had to do was be obedient and they had to have true faith in God that it would occur. Okay. They walked around the city. They were told to be quiet. We're told to stay in the house and be quiet until it is time for us to do something. And that is to be bold. Okay. Now we will wait until prompted. And then in faith, we will shout the gospel with everything we've got. All right, then understanding the injustice, okay? In these verses, just as a, a helpful coaching tip, ignore the words of Israel and Jerusalem and Nebuchadnezzar for this time period. They're very important in context. But for what I'm going to be talking to you about, kind of don't pay attention to that. Just pay attention to the heart of God that is inside of the words because the heart of God has never changed and will never change. And that's what we need to pay attention to. So we've got Jeremiah 25, 4 to 12. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, repent now every one of his evil way and his evil doings. 
and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after the other gods to serve them and worship them. And do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord. And you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against these nations all around and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be desolate and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Okay, so let's connect some dots because that's a historical event. Okay, but there's still prophetic patterning that God has that's going to happen. So the injustice of why people are going to have judgments come upon them is the servants and the prophets have been sent to clarify God's word. That's happened. Now, the evil people have not repented to earn the grace of the promised land, just like we see in this verse. How? By serving other gods, worshiping other gods, and not listening to God's warnings, they are staying out of grace, okay? Because of disobedience against the land of God's people and their inhabitants, they will be utterly destroyed and astonishment, a hissing, which in the Hebrew means a mocking, and a perpetual de desolation, so ruined forever. Okay, then also the very clear part that was in yellow is the Christians are taken. It says the voice of mirth, which is in the Hebrew is joy. We know from a former prophecy that joy is only able to be had by Christians in our season. There's happiness and there's other feelings, but true joy is only from God. Okay, then the voice of gladness in the Hebrew is the joy of God. And then the voice of the bride, which is the church, the voice of the bridegroom, which is Jesus, the sound of the millstone being stopped is meaning a, a um, famine will be triggered. And then the light of the lamp, which are the bright ones that come and help and save. And then the Holy Spirit. Those are going to be taken off of the earth for the final judgments. But there are some judgments that are coming before we all go. Okay. That's what we're trying to clarify. So let's look at the next piece. Understanding that his are spared. Okay. Ezekiel 9, starting at verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain, go out. And then they went out and they killed in the city. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone and I fell on my face and I cried out and I said, ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out of your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great and the land is full of bloodshed 
and a city full of perversity. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. Now, the mark on their forehead in the Hebrew is Tav, which is a mark sign for exemption for judgment, and also used of a cross. What are the odds of that? A cross that is branded into the thigh or the neck of a horse. It is so burned in like a cross. So imagine these people probably had a cross on their foreheads. Okay. Now, Revelation 7, 3 is very connected to this. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. In the Greek, the stamp or the seal is um, to take a mark upon, a seal to make a person safe from Satan, proof of authenticity to prove one's testimony to a person that he is what he proclaims to be. So this is very, very connected. Now, let's look and see. Judgment is not for the obedient, okay? So number one, the mark on the foreheads of the ones who sigh and cry over the abominations. Why? Because they side with God. They mourn over what breaks his heart and the disrespect that people have tromped upon him. So when you do things that God says don't do, that's disrespecting God. And if you're um, not mourning that, then you're not on God's team because that should make you like, why, are, why is everyone doing this? I can't handle this anymore. I can't take it anymore. Stop doing this to my God, right? But the people who aren't mourning, they side with the evils that are going on. That's the facts. Okay, number two, do not let your eyes spare or have pity. This is not encouraging us to give, to make any harm or kill anyone. This entire verse was a historical event. We're looking at the heart behind it. Okay, so we are not supposed to go and harm anyone that is doing something against God ever. This is saying to mourn over them is to side with them, not with God. Why? Because they're getting what their just recompense is. If God is justice and he is perfect, then whatever justice he determines for those people is appropriate and we aren't supposed to mourn over that. Now, when a violent criminal gets life in prison, right? Those he harmed don't feel pity um, for the person. They feel safer. They feel like justice had happened. The only pity that is really given is when someone who didn't do a crime is put away and they're like, I didn't even do this. Why am I in jail? And then you feel pity for that person. So if you're feeling pity for the people who are getting justice, you're siding with them. Okay. You're saying whatever they did wasn't really that unjust. That's what you're saying. Okay. Number three, none marked or harmed. None marked are harmed. They do not even come near the marked. Why? Because they're innocent and undeserving of justice. In our case, it is because of Jesus' blood as our covering and our obedience to the Lord and all his commands. Now, this reinforces why we are to have no fear. Okay, so we need to ask the important question of what is the proper response, okay? So Daniel 9.20. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. And then Daniel 9, 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the books, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and my confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, 
and all the people of the land, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Ezekiel 3, 7. But the house of the Lord will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard of heart. Ezekiel 3.19 Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Okay, so the proper response is we should pray. We need to pray, confess our own sins, confess the sins of the people of the land, and present supplication. That means asking for grace. Okay? This is what we have been told for two years straight. We keep being told by the Lord, pray for those that need to have their chains broken and their hearts softened so that they may submit to God and have grace and find salvation and avoid eternal hell, but instead have eternal salvation, right? This is what we're being told. Praise God. Notice that Daniel praised God for being a covenant keeping God and having mercy on those who are obedient. Daniel also proclaims God's righteousness. Admit the sin and shame it has brought to his people on behalf of those who are not in obedience. Remember, the church gets judged first. It's going to be sorted before we go. And there's going to be some things you wish to grieve over. Do not, because that's like siding with the wrong team. Acknowledge that you tried to reach them, but they would not hear. You acknowledge that to God. And then be released from any guilt for you indeed did try. So if you have tried to reach your different family members and your different people and they won't listen to you, you are clear and you are being obedient. You've tried. Now it's God's turn in the right timing to help turn them. Okay? You don't keep hyping and griping about it. Connecting Jericho to justice. Okay, so he said, like Jericho, so we're going to connect that to why this is all, why is this all connected? Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you and... Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Amos 5, 4. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. Amos 5, 13 to 15. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live so that the Lord God of hosts will be with you. As you have spoken, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Mark 16, 15 to 18. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then Zechariah 9, 16, the Lord, their God, will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. Okay. So remember, Jericho, the three things were to be silent until told, and the battle is won by obedience and faith in God. Okay, so let's look at these similarities. We've got number one, acknowledge that God is perfect and just. Okay, so we understand that God is the one who makes the rules, right? Number two, wait for him and then be blessed. Number three, seek him and live. 
And then number four, in the evil time, be prudent and silent that you may live so that the Lord of hosts will be with you. So this is like reinforcing that silence, right? This is a pattern in the Bible. God wants obedience, silence, and waiting upon him no matter what it looks like outside. And then what is all the waiting for? So number one is the right time to be bold for Christ and share the gospel. And number two is God will save his flock. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for that opportune moment when God pushes us to be bold for him. And we're waiting for him to come get us, right? We want to, we want to go. We want to go to the next thing because we love him that much, right? We'll give up everything in this life. We don't care. That's fine. Okay, so that's the uh, words and the verses that go with it. And I hope you have a great day. See you soon.